Amen. Well, let's get into our word for this morning. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're coming to the end of the book, and this is the last message in the series today. So if you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and while you are turning there, let me give you our quote for the week. Our quote for the week. Are you, are you ready for it? It says this. If you you rarely will see, you you will rarely see what God is willing to do in secret until he sees what you are willing to do in public. Meditate on that for a moment. You will rarely see what God is willing to do in secret until he sees what you are willing to do in public. Amen. You got to understand that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego couldn't stand before the furnace without God doing something with them in secret, in their quiet times, alone in prayer and in the word. God did something in them. So when the time came, they were able to stand publicly, and then God was willing to perform miracles for them publicly. Amen. So we will rarely see what God is willing to do in secret until, unless, he will, unless he sees what we are willing to do in public. Amen? Amen. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to start in our word today. We are in chapter 12, and we're going, I mean, verse 12, going to the end of the chapter. This is our last message in this series, and we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Our theme in this series has been an authentic Life. Let's read. Paul, reading the King James Version, final words to the Thessalonican Christians. We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, but be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint at heart, uphold the peace, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and make you and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Father, we ask you to bless your word now in these moments. We desire to hear from you. Holy Spirit of God, speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Come on. You may be seated. Paul, Paul, Paul includes this last, this is his last message. In this series of messages, in this series, we've been talking about an authentic life. So far, we've talked about how, how an authentic life must be involved and be a part of an authentic community. And in being a part of an authentic community, and from that authentic community should come authentic ministry. And as a result of doing authentic ministry, from that authentic ministry, to make that ministry authentic, there must be authentic encouragement. Encouragement for one another and encouragement for those who don't know the Lord. In that authentic encouragement, it should promote us to, to operate in an authentic discipleship, helping people to grow in their faith in God and become just like Jesus. And that discipleship should be displayed by an authentic walk. And that walk should be motivated by an authentic hope. And this hope moves us to the point where we're going to be talking about this last message of the day that causes us and encourages us to apply and live in an authentic accountability to one another. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, an authentic accountability. Amen. An authentic accountability, which is sometimes in church a bad word. Amen. Because we don't want to be accountable to nobody. Amen. Lights. 
Hallelujah. But Paul, in this message, concluding this message, closes with an exhortation to the people to honor their leaders uh, for their labor uh, among them and to be accountable to them in terms of their leadership, as well as he asks, he prays for them to have wisdom as to how they are to treat one another. And then Paul ends this message with a benediction that God would keep them holy until the return of Jesus Christ. Paul is admonishing these uh, Thessalonican Christians in his last phrase of this message, how important it is that we be accountable to one another. Are you with me today? Someone once said this about accountability. They said this, that, but too often we confuse love with permissiveness. We think that if you love me, you let me do what I want. Is it, it isn't. It is not love to fail to dissuade another believer from sin. Any more than it is love to, 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 to take a drink away from a drunkard or an alcoholic or to take matches away from a child or a baby. True fellowship out of love for one another demands accountability. True fellowship out of love for one another demands accountability. Love doesn't let a baby just hold a matches because he want to hold it. Love protects. Love doesn't tell an alcoholic, take as many drinks as you want to, because love wants to keep them from the disease of alcohol. And love doesn't allow you just to do what you want to. Love wants the best for you. So therefore, when it sees you going in a direction, it's going to harm you, hurt you, or hurt others. Love seeks to hold you accountable to what is right, to what is good, and what is fair. Daniel Webster makes this statement in, his, in, in his, one of his testimonies. He says this. He says, my greatest thought is my accountability to God. My greatest thought is my accountability to God. Is, that should be the greatest thought of every believer. Our accountability to God. Because one day we're going to stand before God and have to give an account. And listen, and God ain't going to hand out well done willy-nilly. Amen. That well done is going to be well earned and going to be well given because of the way you've chosen to live and submit to him and be accountable to him now. Our greatest thought should be our accountability to God. And listen, and when, listen, that accountability, accountability to God breeds accountability to one another. If I am truly accountable and willing to be accountable to God, I have no problem being accountable to you. As a matter of fact, I want to be accountable to you because I want you to hold my feet to the fire so that I can continue to honor God the way he wants me to. And so and as you hold my arms up, I hold your arms up. As we encourage one another, we, we can become, become more like him. So when I am truly and sincerely accountable to God, I really want my brothers and sisters around me so I can be accountable to them. So they can keep me on track, going in the way God wants me to go and doing what God would have me to do. In the text, as we look at it, Paul talks about, when he talks about the issue of authentic accountability, he said that we should recognize that our accountability should be in at least four ways. We should be accountable to one another in at least four ways. All right. Paul points out that we need to be accountable to each other when it comes to leadership. We need to be accountable to each other when it comes to leadership. God doesn't give us leadership for nothing. He gives us leadership to guide us and direct us, and we should be willing to be accountable to the leadership that he places over us and that we sit under. Are you with me today? Not only are we to be accountable to leadership, we ought to be accountable to loyalty to each other. Amen. We ought, to, we ought to be accountable to loyalty to each other, upholding one another. I'm going to show you how that is laid out in this text and, and supporting one another, encouraging one another. Not only should we be accountable in loyalty to one another, we should be accountable in behavior and the way we act toward one another, the way we act in the world. We ought to be accountable and God wants us to be accountable for our behavior. And he tells us in the text how we ought to act. And then last, we ought to be accountable to belief. In other words, we ought to hold each other to the right belief, the correct belief, and the, and the biblical belief that keeps us in line with God's will, God's word, and God's character. So we need to be accountable to belief. We shouldn't just let brothers and sisters come up with anything. Amen, lights. 
We need to make sure what they come up with is in line with the word, fits with the word, and it's what God says in the word. Amen. So we need to be accountable to belief. All right. Let, let me lay these out and I'll be out of your way. First of all, he says the first thing that we need to do in, in terms of, of authentic accountability is that we need to be accountable to leadership. Look at what he says in verses 12 and 13. He says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. Recognize those who labor among you. The Greek word used there is the word oida. Oida literally means to honor. It means to show honor to. It means to respect. And it also means to understand. So God now expects me as an individual in church to honor and respect and give due reverence and honor to those that he's appointed as leaders. That God would not only would just want me to honor and respect him, God would want me to honor and respect him with a level of understanding. Amen. And he gives you a caveat how you should honor him. He said you should honor them or recognize them in love who labor. He says who labor among you and who admonish you. All right, women, eh? So it's not just they got the title of leadership, of a leader, but they are doing something in that leadership role. He says you are to honor them, uh, those who are among you, who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and, and, said, and admonish you. You should honor them for their labor among you, and you should honor them for the role that God has placed on them, and you should honor them for the admonishment. Now, the word admonish, we, we in, the, in the church, we kind of have a, a mixed definition of that. Times time we hear the word admonish, we think of it as negative. Think of it as negative. You know, sometimes folks say, I had to admonish that brother. I admonish that sister. I got them, I put it, I admonish. But that ain't what the word admonish means. In the text, in the original language, the word admonish means to teach or to instruct. So when God's talking about those who are leadership, he ain't talking about those who call you out and embarrass you. Amen. He ain't talking about those who, who point at you and, 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 and point out your, your wrongs and stuff in public. He's talking about those who teach you who instruct you to help you grow in the word. Those are the ones you honor. Those are the ones you respect. Those are the ones you submit to leadership because they are teaching you. They are instructing you in the word of God. And then God says, when, when they are, if they are doing that kind of leadership over you, he says, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Esteem. It's an interesting word in the Greek. It, 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 it means to, to view, uh, to, have, to hold a view, to have an opinion, to consider or to regard. In other words, it carries the idea of accountability. That your view of the person that leads you should be high based on how they teach you and how they are over you. The word over not only just means that they guide you, but they are over you in the terms of the way they live and they're the examples for you. Okay. So now I esteem these leaders. I'm accountable to these leaders because they are ones that practice what they preach. They are ones who display not only what they preach from the pulpit, but what they preach from their lives. Amen, lights. Those are the kind of folks God would want us to be accountable to. Not, not bl blindly, not blanketly, not because they got a title but because of their labor in terms of what they do in preaching and teaching the word to you and at the same time living the word before you and their lives not only admonish you as long as well as their words. Amen. And then if they're doing all that, God says esteem them highly. Esteem, esteem them highly. Re re you have a high opinion of them, view them with high regard, consider them. Be accountable to them. Amen. Now, let me give you the flip side. If you find somebody that you're leading that you cannot feel you're accountable to, don't stay there and cause division. It's not your job to correct them. That's God's job. If you find somebody you can't be accountable to because of their lifestyle, Go somewhere where you can. Amen, lights. Amen. It's God's job to discipline his leaders. You ain't they Holy Ghost. He is. And believe me, God's a good disciplinarian. 
Yeah. You might say, well, you know, I've seen some leaders have been in stuff for a long time. And, and it's why they keep, because we keep getting in God's way. If we get out of God's way, God will deal with it. We pray. We submit. And if we can't, if we feel like we can't follow, we go to someone we can't. If we feel like God has called us there and to stay there, then you stay there and pray. Amen. You stay there and pray. Not cause the vision, not tell what you don't like, not, not go through the congregation, tell people what about this leader, what you don't. You stay there and pray that God's going to bring order and deal with correction. If, he, if you really sense that he's telling you to stay there, pray. Amen. But if you can't stand it, go somewhere where you can. Find somebody you, that you can listen to, be accountable to. Follow, love, and operate in your gift in obedience. Amen. Other than that, God expects you to be accountable to the leadership that you are under. But not only does he expect us to be accountable to leadership, he expects us to be accountable to loyalty. He says loyalty to each other. Look at what he says in verses 13 and 14. 14 well, 14 and 15, rather. He says, now I exhort you, brethren, I exhort you, brother, and the word exhort is an interesting word. It's the word parakaleo in the Greek, and it literally means to encourage, console, urge, or employ. God is telling, Paul is encouraging us, Paul is challenging us, Paul is urging us, and Paul is even imploring us that we follow the, the examples that he's about to say, the, the dictates or the principles or precepts he's telling us that we to practice in order to demonstrate loyalty to one another. Because one of the key things about loyalty, and I know the word loyalty is sometimes kind of not miss, is missing in church because we use more of the word commitment than we use the word loyalty. But God not only expects me to be committed to the cause and the, and the, and the, and the gospel, God expects me to be loyal to the people that he placed me around. And the key to loyalty in terms of that is being able to show up, being able to be there, being able to do what is necessary in their lives to cause each of us to grow, to become who God wants us to become. So Paul lays out some, some, some criteria for loyalty. He says, first of all, warn those who are unruly. That's the first criteria for loyalty. Warn those who are unruly. Don't just sit back and turn your head and say, oh, well, pastor get that when he get to it. You see them being unruly, God says warn them. Now, let me help you break it down. Unruly, uh, translates, disorderly, out of order. Amen. There's one translation. You can translate the word unruly, out of order, that what they're doing is out of order with the context of the word, out of order in the context of the, of the group that you're a part of, out of order. Your job, you know them, you're in relationship with them. Go to them and warn, hey, we, don't, we, let, we got a better way to deal with that. There's a better way to do that that, that will create harmony, unity, and, and will make us all feel good about it. You, this is not the way to do that. That's out of order. Okay? So we ought to warn them. Warn. It didn't say, it didn't say, Kick, challenge, or beat them up. Warn them. Just go up to them and say, hey, this is not a good idea. Don't get no argument or fight over it. Warn. Okay? Not only warn. That will work down to be translated disorder. Here's another good one. It's can translate it, and, and, and it's a translated in New Living Translation. It's translated this way, lazy. Warn those who are lazy. <laughs> lazy and doing what they're supposed to do. Lazy and not in, a, in worship. Lazy and growing in the word. Lazy and sharing their faith. Lazy and being who God would want them to be. Did you know God deems you lazy when you're not obedient to what he tells you to do and what, you, what he wants you to do? He considers you lazy. You got time for everything else but not for the Lord. You, you're lazy. You can do everything else you want to do, but you, you ain't got, you too tired to do what you want to do. You lazy, spiritually. You're lazy. And listen, listen, you want to, you want to hear what God, he feels about lazy folk? I tell you to read Proverbs 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and part of 23. And all three of those chapters in the book of Proverbs, which is the book of wisdom, God talks about lazy people. Matter of fact, in the King James Version, he calls them sluggards. But here's one I wanted to share with you today. Out of Proverbs 21, verse 20, 25, listen to what he says. He says this. He says, the desire of a lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. A desire of a lazy man. See, a lazy man got a desire. 
He wants stuff. He, what he or she wants to do, they want things to happen, but they refuse. They, their hands refuse to do what is necessary to fulfill their desire. So since their hands refuse to do it, it kills them. Spiritually, they refuse to study. They refuse to pray. They refuse to memorize. They refuse to go to Bible study. They just come to Sunday on, on, on Sunday, get what they can, can what they get, and walk out, and don't, 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 don't look back until next Sunday. Lazy. And that desire, he says, and you become, you, you tend to kill yourself spiritually when you are in the word on a regular basis. You're too lazy to open a book. Too lazy to... Take your hands and read through the Bible. Too lazy to get to Bible. Say, now we own Zoom. Too lazy to go to Zoom. <laughs> and he says, the die of a lazy man kills him because his hands refuse. He refused to do what's necessary in his life to meet his desire. And God, Paul tells us, that God tells us a part of our loyalty to one another is not to look at that and let, it, and let it slide. We need to warn that. We need to love a brother and sister enough to warn them that that's not where you want to be. Come on, let me help you. Let me encourage you. Let me, let me come alongside you and help you get the motivation you need because God's got some great things in store for you, and this is not where he wants you to be. So we ought to warn those. We ought to warn the look well, going on. He says, he says, warn those who are, are disorderly. Encourage those who are timid. He didn't say come down on them, don't, don't, don't criticize them, don't, don't, don't humiliate them. Those who are intimidated, he talks about uh, 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 comfort the faint and hearted. Encourage, he says, encourage those who are timid. Faint heart just simply means timid. There are some of us who are not that strong in the Lord, not that, that, that mature. That's all right. You are growing. But the goal of us who are mature is not to embarrass them by humiliating them. Amen. That's not the job. That's not the call. That's not the love. We are to, we listen, we are to encourage those who are intimidated. We got meaning we come alongside them. We come alongside them, encourage them. We come alongside them, help them. Amen. Too much we sit back and watch a brother and sister fall and then gloat over their fall. It's not what God calls us to do. We are to be there for one another. Even when we are hesitant about really stepping out. Listen, how many of us when we first got saved were scared to witness? Me? How many of us are intimidated about some of the things that the, that, the, the, that the scripture says we ought to do as believers? Me? But because the people who loved and cared for the Lord and loved and cared for me came alongside and encouraged me, walked with me, and, and motivated me, didn't give up on me, I can get to a point now I can do that for somebody else. That's what God calls us to do for one another. Comfort those who are faint-hearted. Encourage those who are timid. Don't, don't, don't degrade them by telling them where they're not spiritually. They may not be there, and it's not your job to point it out anyway. Your job is to love them through it. Uphold the weak, it said. Be tent I like the translation says, take tender care of those who are weak. Take tender care of those who are immature in their faith, not strong in the Lord, who are yet growing. Take tender care of those. Listen, the Bible describes them as babes. That's how the Bible describes them. It describes them as babes in the faith. Anybody had a baby and just when it got born, set it over on the, on, the, on the seat and said, feed yourself? When it cried, you said, you, 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 you strong, you here now. Go ahead and take care of yourself. Diaper, get where you, I, hey, I ain't got time. Change your own diaper. I'm talking about a baby. We tenderly care for babies. When they cry, we respond. When they have needs, we meet it. When they need help, we're there. And we're encouraging them, even at the same time. We're not scolding them. And we're not ridiculing them. And we're not putting them now. God says to, 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 to encourage those, to, to tenderly care for those who uphold those. Uphold, that's what the King James says. Uphold those who are we hold their arms up, hold them up until they're able to walk on their own. Just like we do babies when they learn how to walk. And even after they learn how to walk, we're still there for them for 18 years until they get to a point even longer than that. Sometimes for 40 years, some 50 years. <laughs> we're still holding their arms up because they are babies. Because they are babies. Amen. 
Amen. But we ought to tenderly care and be tenderly careful. He said, be patient with everyone. King James says, be patient with all. Be patient with everyone. I want to be patient with everyone. See that you uh, see that no one pays evil for evil. It's not your job to get back at people. But you don't know what they did. God don't care what they did. And God absolutely knows what they did. He knows better than I do what they did. He's omniscient. But he still tells you, don't go tit for tat. Don't, don't get into the mode of thinking what you're going to do to pay them back. How you're going to make them feel like they made you feel. Because that's not your job. Amen. Let me give you some scriptures. Paul, Paul, this is not the first time Paul says this. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, write this down because it's not in your sermon notes. But write this down. He says, Romans chapter 12 says, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. God says, your response to evil should be good. No matter who the evil comes from. Oh, I know that's a good one. Are you kidding me, Pastor? No, I'm not kidding you. I'm telling you what the word said. Don't render evil to any. Your motive, your, your response is to do good in spite of that, the fact that they treat you evil. Woo-wee. First Peter chapter three. I'm giving you some verses because you got to you have you got to have this rooted in the word. You can't just hear my say or somebody say this is what the word said. Peter says not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Know that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. The reason God don't want you to render evil for evil, because God has called you to be a blessing. And listen, as you bless, God will bless. Even the evil people in your life, if you will bless them, God will bless you. But if you stoop to their level, you steal your own blessing. You negate your own blessing. You keep God from blessing you. And here's one. If that don't move you, check this one out. Proverbs. This one stopped me. Maybe it'll stop you. This one says, Proverbs 17 says this. Whoever rewards evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. Let me say it again. Whoever rewards evil for good, evil will not depart from your house. So you want evil to stay in your house? Just, don't, just go tit for tat. Just keep giving evil for evil. Evil going to stay in your house. Because he who, who repays evil, who repays, who, who, he who repays evil, he says, like I said, uh, for good, if he rewards evil for good, evil will not depart from your house. Listen, listen. And you can't do this on your own. You already know that, right? That's why y'all having a struggle listening to it, because you, how in the world I'm going to do that? <laughs> God didn't tip for you to do this on your own. That's why he gave you the Holy Ghost. Listen, I, 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 when I read this, I thought about uh, some work that I'm doing right now, preparing to go to Birmingham at the end of the month. I've been invited by the Power Initiative to go to Birmingham, Alabama, and to uh, retrace the footsteps of the civil rights movement and the breaking down of segregation in uh, this country at at where the stronghold was it uh, of it was in Birmingham, Alabama, under Bull Connor and those guys back in the day. And so we've been charged to go. And in the meantime, they've asked us to do certain things in preparation. One of them is to read uh, Dr. King's book, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And so I've been reading that. And then we've been watching some videos. And one of the videos that I watched was about the Children's March. I don't know if many of us remember this. I didn't recall this until I was reminded about it. The Children's March is what broke the back of segregation in Birmingham. It wasn't the adults who did it. And it wasn't Dr. King who did it. It was the children. It was the teenagers in Birmingham who got together and decided that they were going to protest. The adults were afraid in Birmingham because any adults who tried to uh, retaliate against the law lost their jobs, lost their homes, and lost their cars. Everything got repossessed. 
Dr. King, when he went there in 63 to lead the march, he didn't get the kind of turnout that he thought he was going to get. And so when he went out to do the, the, the protest and demonstration, that's how come he ended up in jail. And he stayed in jail in Birmingham for over 30 days because he thought once he got arrested, the adults would respond, and they didn't. The kids did. And, and the thing that got me, you read it, look it up. I'm going to tell you the whole story. Google it yourself. Just say the Children's March in 1963, Birmingham. You hear it's powerful. But one of the things that they were doing when training these children, they were training these children for protest. And this is what they said to the kids. If you can't stand to be beat, kicked, or spit on, don't come to the march. Because the goal is if you're kicked, spit, and beat on, you cannot respond in violence. You cannot retaliate. This is a nonviolent response. And so no matter what they do to you, don't respond. You had kids as young as four years old going out on this march. Dick Gregory tells a story that when he got locked up for going out to that march, he went in jail. There was a four-year-old boy locked up in jail. And he asked the four-year-old, why are you in jail? And he couldn't even say freedom. All he said was beat him. He's there for beat him because he couldn't say freedom, but he knew why he was there. He was there for freedom. And listen, and those kids responded according to their training. 5,000 of them got arrested and put in jail. They were, in, they were in cattle yards as well as in the jailhouse. 5,000. All 5,000 did not respond to any violence that was perpetrated against them. And they can do, listen, you can't tell me they did that on their own. Because the documentary said while they were in jail, they were singing songs, spiritual songs, Christian songs, back and forth to each other. Boys was on one side, girls were on the other side. The girls were singing a spiritual song, the boys would answer with a spiritual song. And they were talking about their faith in God and their trust in God and their right to be treated like everybody else. And they knew that it was their God-given right. God gave them the ability not to respond. God gave them the ability that no matter what they went through, through the dogs, through the hoses. When you see that, 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 that picture that show you on TV, people would be shot water hoses in Birmingham, that wasn't adults, that were teenagers. Those were teenagers. That was a children's march. They went into Woolworths and sat at that bench and got beat up by the white folks and kicked out. You ain't tell me that strength just didn't come from themselves. No, that strength came from the Lord. They, they knew what it meant not to return evil for evil because returning evil would not have caused, could, got them to accomplish what they were wanting to accomplish in terms of freedom and civil rights. Listen, God has a purpose in you not responding evil for evil because he wants to manifest his glory in your life. And if you are willing to do what he tells you to do, I guarantee you, you won't be at a disadvantage. You'll be at an advantage. He tells us how to be loyal to one another. We can't repay evil for evil. Not only that, he just tells us not to be or He says also, do, but always try to do good to each other and for all people. That's your response to evil. Always try to do good. Always seek to do good. Always dis focus on doing the good. Proverbs, Psalms, rather, 34, 14 reminds us, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's what God says our posture ought to be. No matter what kind of evil comes against us, our goal is to respond with the goodness of God and to seek the peace of God, knowing that God is the one who vindicates. God is the one who repays. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, Lord, the Lord says. I don't have to worry about retaliation because God will retaliate for me if I will let him. Amen. And when God does it, it's better because I'm an advantage. And when I do it, it's a disadvantage because I take, I steal my own blessing. Amen. So not only am I to be uh, uh, authentic, account accountable in my leadership, in my, but also in my loyalty, but also in my behavior. Now, now the one moves from the aspect of how I ought to treat one another in terms of being loyal to each other to how God expects me to act personally. All right, what me say? And Paul just begins to list some things. As he gets into the next verses in, in verses 16 and 20 to 22, Paul just begins to listen. Here's how you ought to behave. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast to the good and abstain from every form of evil. That's how you and I ought to behave. 
Somebody wrote this, a book by Patrick Moeller said, uh, entitled I Surrender. He said this in the book about behavior. He said, that the, he said that the church's problem with integrity is this. There's a misconception, he says, in the church. We, he says the mis misconception is this, that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. It's a change of belief but not a change of behavior. There's a misconception in the church. That I can add Christ to my life, but somehow I keep excusing the sin. You know, you know how we always believe the lie, I'm a sinner saved by grace? I call that a lie. Because the bottom line is, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm saved by grace, but I'm no longer a sinner. Because God has delivered me. The fact that I continue to say that I am a sinner, I keep saying I can have Christ and, and, and not subtract sin. Yes, yeah, sin going to tempt me. Sin going to challenge me. Yes, yeah, sin going to keep But did you know God tells me I don't have to sin? I've been given the power not to sin. I can choose not to yield to sin. God told me if I can focus on him, he can keep me from sin. I'm not saying that you can be still. I'm saying that you can live a sinless life if you want to. Because he gives you the power to do so. Believe it or not, 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 tells you that. If you add these things to your life and you do so consistently, you will never fall. Our biggest problem, like he says here, is that we keep thinking that somehow these two can go together. God didn't come to let me coexist with sin. God came to free me from sin, to deliver me from sin. The biggest problem in the church is that we keep excusing sin and keep making it seem as though, well, I'm just human. No, you ain't, you're more than human now, saint. Can I, can I say that to you? You are more than human now, saint. You have the divine power of God abiding in you. You are no longer natural, my saint. You are supernatural because the supernatural power of God lives in your life. You like superheroes. You like supernatural people. Look in the mirror. Remind yourself, I'm a supernatural being, not because of who I am, but because of who he is in me. I can do all things. Ain't that what Paul said? I can do all, not just some things, all things. And the all things mean I don't have to sin. Some of y'all been bound by your past because the devil keep telling you that sin in your past ain't going to never go away. And you keep thinking and stumbling over it and falling over it because you think it's true. But you got to tell yourself what God done told you already in the word. You free. You free. You free. And you got to start living like a free man. Got to start living like a free woman. Stop giving the devil foothold in your life. Bible had already told you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says if you resist him, he will flee from you. Don't you know the devil is a coward? Because if you find out who you are, the devil runs from you. I'm just trying to help somebody this morning. I'm just trying to get somebody to understand you ain't got to live a defeated life. We, we, we admire, we admire all these people in the Bible. And we admire the power that they displayed in their lives. We read about them and we talk about them. And we say, whoa, wow, what great men and women of faith. God is looking for some folk like that right now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He just didn't do that for Shadrach. He wanted to do it for you. He said, we're free. We're free. And we need to live like we're free. Amen. It's about our behavior. Our behavior can be like Christ because he's given us everything we need to be what he wants you to be, us to be. That same spirit that dwells in Christ dwells in you and me. 
The same spirit that raised the dead, the same spirit that healed the sick, the same spirit that opened blinded eyes. That's why Jesus said, these and greater shall you do because I go to my father because he already knew you have the same spirit he has abiding in you and you can do the same things and even greater if you trust in who he is in you. Hallelujah. 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 I got to move on. I know. I know. Hallelujah. So he tells us that our biggest problem, our misconception is that we add Christ and don't subtract sin. And the challenge for us is that we need to understand God has called us to live sinless lives and he didn't do, call us to do it on our own. He's given us the ability to do it in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So therefore, with Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost, with, 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 with the Holy Ghost, I can rejoice always. With, with, with the Holy Ghost, I, I can rejoice always. Listen, 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 listen. My joy is not based on what's happening. My joy is not based on my situation. My joy is not based on the things that are good or bad or not or, or right or wrong. My joy is based on my relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he never changes. So since he never changes, I can always have joy. I can always respond in joy. I can always experience joy because Jesus is always with me. He promised you that. Yes, he did. He told you when you got saved, I'll never leave you nor forsake you or let you down. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. Listen, even in what you're going through right now, as hard and as difficult as it is, take your eyes off of it. What are you saying, Pastor? I said, take your eyes. Stop looking at it. What am I supposed to look at? Jesus. That's all you need to look at. Don't, 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 don't look at it. Just listen, the longer you look at it, the more depressed you get. The longer you look at it, the more frustrated you get. The longer you look at it, the more hopeless you get. The longer you look at it, the more helpless you get. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants to get you in depression. He wants to get you in a suicidal state. He wants to get you in a mindset that you think is hopeless. Ain't no way to get out of it. But see, God, God already gave you the answer. He said, I tell you, look to the hills from which coming my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He's able. He's able. Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, how do I find joy when I'm sad? Begin to act like it. <laughs> That's what I tell them. What do you mean act like? Bible tells me to operate by faith and not by sight. And faith is not based on my feelings. Faith is based on the fact of God's word. So when I start doing what God's word says and acting like I got joy, what happens is my feelings line up with my faith, with my, with my act. And that's the next thing you know, I start feeling the joy that God says I'm supposed to have. But as long as I look at that situation, as long as I think about that problem, as long as I meditate on that trial and tribulation, I'm going to be sad. I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to be disheartened. But when I begin to remember who Jesus is and what he can do and he promises to do that for me joy unspeakable and full of glory begins to well up in my soul David knew it David knew it David knew it David knew it David knew what joy would do David said the joy of the Lord is my strength that's where he found strength he found his strength in the midst of what he was going through by rejoicing in the Lord y'all got me going <sighs> <laughs> Holy Ghost. <laughs> With the Holy Ghost, I can rejoice. With the Holy Ghost, I can rejoice always. With the Holy Ghost, I can pray without ceasing. I can pray without See, li Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen carefully. So I, I was saying this to my niece uh, when I was back in Chicago. I was telling her because she was on her journey. She's really seeking to grow. You know, I was telling her, listen, this. we got to stop taking our prayers for granted. Let me say, let me say again. We got to stop. Let me see. Now, I say that because the church, I'm not talking about unsafe folk. Church, we take prayer for granted. Prayer is the last thing on the list. And even if we do pray, we're praying, thinking about what we're going to do when we finish. Because we don't really believe that there is power 
in our prayer. We don't. Because if we did, we would stop running to and fro, hither, thither, and yon, trying to tell everybody, get everybody to answer our question. Because if we really believed in the power of prayer, we take it to the Lord and leave it there, like the song said, and know that he's going to answer. But because we don't believe, because we don't trust the power of prayer, once we get done praying, we're still worried. Once we get done prayer, we're still fretting. Once we get done prayer, we're still trying to figure out, how am I going to get out of this? How is this going to stop? How is it going to happen? What's my child? What my, what's going to happen with my money? What's going to happen with my finance? What's going to happen with my kid? What's going to happen with... We stick up, from, we get up from the prayer more worried than we were when we went into the prayer because we take prayer for granted and God reminds me daily my mother's in heaven now but God reminds me daily that I stand before you and answer the prayer and my mama was 21 years old, carrying a baby, one-year-old baby from Hattiesburg, Mississippi to Joliet, Illinois, because her husband had cheated on her and she, and she had left her. She didn't know which way to go. She prayed for that baby and said, God, he's yours. Whatever you want to do for him and whatever you want to do with him, use him, Father. I put him in your hands. That was my mama's prayer. I didn't even know she prayed it on the, uh, until 22 years later on the day of my ordination. When she came up to me in the, at the end of the service, hugging me and with tears in her eyes and said, I prayed for this. You, 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 you got to understand, God answers prayer. He ain't just saying something to make you feel good when he say, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. He's not telling you that just to make you feel good. God answers prayer. And if you believe it, if you trust him, if you don't take your prayers for granted and believe with all your heart that God is going to. Listen, I've been praying for some stuff for 20 years. I'm still believing God's going to answer you might be saying, how long, Pastor? I said, I don't know how long. I don't tell you how long. All I know is God's able. And then when I wake up on this morning, it ain't answered yet. I'm thanking him that the answer is on his way. I believe that he is. I believe that he can. I know without a shadow of doubt that he will. I'm not going to give up on it till I see it. Because I know he's able. Listen, God gives you so many illustrations. The one is Daniel. You remember that story, Daniel? Started praying on day one. It's in the book of Daniel. He started praying for God to answer prayer. And the Bible said God dispatched Gabriel on the day he began to pray. And the Bible said Gabriel was on his way with Daniel's answer. And he ran into the prince of Persia, which is in essence another title for the devil and a demon. And he got in war with that demon. And the demon was trying to keep him from getting to Daniel. So he said he I was fighting that I had to go back and get Gabe Michael and me and Michael came back and We defeated the, the, the Prince of Persia wiped him out and now here I am right here Daniel with your prayers now listen Daniel started on day one It was day 21 when Gabriel showed up and Daniel kept on praying all the way through day 21 till his answer showed up God just tried to remind you you got to keep on praying. It may not be 21 days. It might be two It might be 20 years, but if you keep on praying God's going to show up. He's going to show up. I know he will. He's going to show up. Pray always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And, said, and then it did. Here's a good one. Be thankful in all your circumstances. Ooh, I love this one. Be thankful in all your because as you're praying always, as you're rejoicing, your situations may not always get better. Sometimes they might even get worse. But then when they start getting that way and you talk about, when I've been praying, how come things ain't getting any better? I've been praying. God says, okay, here, here's what you do in your circumstances. This is what you do when you're in, in every circumstance that you find yourself in. He says, give thanks 
in the circumstances, not for the circumstances, in the circumstances, not because of the circumstances, but in the circumstances. And he says, and here's why you give thanks, because you give thanks recognizing that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, meaning that nothing gets to your life if except it goes through the filter of the Holy Spirit of God, and God's intent for you in that circumstance is always good. God says all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So whatever circumstance you find yourself in, recognize if you are a child of God, it is not outside the will of God. And God's going to turn it out for your good as long as you continue to walk by faith and not by sight. God is intending on making every situation in your life conform to his will as long as you keep rejoicing, as long as you keep praying, and as long as you keep believing. Nothing is outside your life as a believer that's not according to the will of God. He's going to work it out. He's going to work it out. Then he says, don't quench the Holy Ghost. Because that's the one you need. He's the one. You, listen, the Holy Ghost helps you to rejoice. The Holy Ghost keeps you praying. The Holy Ghost helps you keep your perspective on your circumstances. It's the Holy Ghost. And then it says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Wow. Bible tells you two things not to do with the Holy Ghost. It says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. And it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, in case you want to know what that is. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Quench means to distinguish its fire. Quench means to dilute it. Quench means to negate its influence in your life. Okay, that's what quench means. So when you, how, how do I, quench? now I know next question. Well, Pastor, how do I quench the Holy Spirit? You, Holy, you quench the Holy Spirit by disobedience. Disobedience quenches the fire of the Holy Ghost in your life because you're ignoring his influence when you're walking in disobedience. You're ignoring his guidance when you're walking in disobedience. You quench the Holy Spirit when you know the word that that voice in your head go this way, but you go that way instead. When you quench the Holy Spirit, when you know that the Bible tells you to stand up and speak a word, but you too scared so you don't speak that word, you just quench the Holy Spirit. You quench the Holy Spirit by obedient by disobedience amen but then it says should i grieve the holy spirit grieve means to cause pain grieve means to make sorry grieve means to 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 render and cause to be sad well, you might say, well, Pastor, how, how if I, I know how I shouldn't quench the, well, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? You grieve the Holy Spirit by practicing sin in your life. As a believer, you still, you practice certain sin that you tell yourself ain't nothing wrong with it. And you're grieving, you're causing pain, you're causing sorrow to God because God wants you to be free from that. God wants you to be delivered from that. God's got something far better for you than what you think the sin is doing for you. But you bought the lie. It ain't hurt nobody. It ain't got nothing to do about nobody. It ain't even my business. It's my business, my business alone. But it's sin. That's why you don't want the church folk to know about it. Because it's sin. That's why you don't want saints to come to your house. Because it's sin. That's why you don't want people to, to call you on the phone or come by, drop by. Because it's sin. You know it's sin. You don't want nobody, if they do come, you don't want them to look in your refrigerator. You sin. There's only one room they can stay in. It's because you've got sin. Because you're hiding things that you know are sin before God. That's why you don't want other folks to find out about it. And you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And God tells us when we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit, we dilute his power and we keep him from doing what he has been sent to do in our lives. The Bible says he's been given to guide us into all truth, to show us things to come and to glorify Christ. When I grieve him and quench him, I stop all of that from happening in my life. So that's why he said don't quench. He's telling us how to behave. He's telling us how to behave, y'all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Check your circumstances. Know it's according to the will of God and make sure you don't quench. 
the Holy Ghost so he can be available and powerful in your life to help you do all these things and more because you are yielding to his leadership day by day and moment by moment. Don't scoff or don't despise prophecy, he said. Prophecy in this text is rendered a pre to preached word, an inspired utterance, a rhema that God may send to you. He says, don't despise it. Despise means to, to have a low opinion of it. Despise means to mock it. Don't have a low opinion of the word and don't mock the word because the word is given to you for power and for, for foundation. And if you obey that word, that word will produce fruit in your life. And la the last thing he says about behavior, he said, uh, he's on, on two more things. He says, but the, he said that the best, he says, but but test everything uh, that is said. Hold on to what is good. We ought to test everything. Paul, Paul points out in First John, John points out in First John chapter 4 in verse 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just don't take somebody's preaching or to prove it for vase value. That's all he's basically saying. Listen to me. Listen, you should be checking what I say according to the word. Amen. But the, the Bible is your verification because the Bible tells you that in the last days, many false prophets, preachers, prophets going to start rise up and say they're of the God. And, and listen, and the real challenge is going to be you, what they say going to sound good and what they say even going to sound biblical. But unless you know what the word of God says yourself, you won't be able to discern the two. That's why the Bible says many going to be led astray by these false prophets and by these false teachers because their thing, their word sounds so good. And, and you know what's going to be the divide, kill, kill factor? Everybody in the world is going to be following after that because most of the world don't know the word anyway. Amen. So it's very important for, that's why I encourage us here to get in the word ourselves. That's why I encourage us here to know the word from there. Listen, 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 check me. And I, and I thank God for the many of you who do. Well, you need to make sure that what you are saying, what is in the, what you're hearing is from the word of God. And then the last thing it says, and stay away from every form of you. Stay away from every form. Stay away from every form. Stay away from every form of evil. As a matter of fact, the King James, the original King James version of this text says, abstain from the appearance of evil. Form in this text can be translated appearance. Stay away from of the not only just the evil itself. Don't be around some that look evil. Because <laughs> li listen, listen, we 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 judge people by their associations. Amen. Lights. Amen. If you didn't know me. And I was hanging around with some folks that you knew were pimps and, 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 and gangbangers and drug dealers. And you saw me in the group. What would you assume about me? You must be a pimp, gangbanger, or drug dealer. Because you and them were a crowd with them folk. That's the only reason why you're hanging out with them. And because that's how we do as, as humans. We associate people based on what we identify them with. And the Bible tells us that if we really want to be, make sure that our witness for God is clear, you got to make sure that you stay away from even what looks evil because the moment you do, the enemy is going to use it as a means of causing somebody who's watching you not to believe in God and not to follow God when they thought you were. And the goal of our lives now that we're saved is not necessarily for ourselves as it is for, for the Lord and for those who God would want us to lead to him by our witness as well as our walk. By witness as well as our walk. By our words as well as our conduct. That's why God would might remind us to stay away from every form. Of, there's a whole bunch of good stuff to hang around with. In this world that blesses and satisfies you would always would not have necessarily having to be around stuff that the enemy identifies with. And that only brings down your testimony and degrades your, your witness before the Lord. That's a whole lot of stuff. Amen. And God would want us to focus on those things that are good. Last and finally, and I'm way over my time and I know that. But let's go here to this last point. He says, not only are we to walk in authentic uh, uh, accountability and leadership, loyalty and behavior. And I don't know why I even have that many notes in that behavior. Anyway, 
But anyway, believe. We ought to be held accountable to our belief. And Paul ends in this benedictory statement in verses 23 to 28. It's, he's coming to the close of the letter. And that he is affirming certain things that we should believe in his statements. First of all, he says, he says, he said, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He says, so the first thing he wants us to be mindful of, that the God of peace will sanctify us completely. So, so what is he telling us to believe in? To believe in our sanctification. Believe that we've been set apart. Believe that now that you're saved, now that you're God, that you are not just trying to get in, you're in, and you have been set apart for God, and God's going to use you for his glory and for your good. That you have been set apart. You didn't have to do anything but accept Jesus, to, uh, Christ in your life, and now that you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life, you're sanctified for God. So that's the first thing we need to believe in is our sanctification. Not in the stuff that the enemy will bring up in our past to try to drag us back down, that I now am been sanctified in Christ. I belong to him, and he is completing that sanctification in me with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The third, second thing he tells me in the text that I need to believe in, that you may hold, that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only am I to believe in my sanctification, I'm to believe in my preservation. That I'm saved, not just now, but for eternity. That God's going to save my whole body, not just my spirit, my whole body, soul, and spirit will be preserved. I need to believe in the power of God's preservation to be able to keep me in my flesh, to be able to keep me in my mind, as well as keep me in my spirit. I got to believe that in order for me to walk that and live that out. I got to believe in my sanctification. I got to believe in my preservation. The last thing he says, and he who calls you is faithful, who is also able to do it. He who calls you is faithful, who's also able to do it. You know what God wants me to believe there? He wants me to believe in God's determination. God had made a determination about you. He's determined to be faithful to you, and he's determined to see you to the end and become who he has ordained you to be. God done made up his mind as far as he's concerned concerning you that everything that he promised you is going to come to pass, and everything that you intended to be is going to happen because God has already determined that in his own spirit for you because you belong to him. And you got to believe in God's determination. God didn't bring you this far to leave you. I don't care how many times you fall over yourself, God don't give up on you. God don't turn his back on you. God will chasten you. God will correct you because you belong to him. But he ain't going to give up on you. He ain't going to throw you out and ain't going to give you up on you. Listen, I, God will take you home before he even let the enemy have you now that you belong to him. That's how determined God is to cause you to become who he has ordained you to be. God is faithful and he will be faithful to you till the end. So not only do I need to believe in my sanctification and I need to believe in my preservation, I need to believe in God's determination for me. That he is intended on making me who he has ordained me to be now that I am his and he is mine. We have been called to walk in authentic accountability, in leadership, loyalty, behavior, and in belief. Let's now purpose to do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. All his bow and all eyes closed. Our Father and our God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word and for this series and for what you've taught us as we've gone through this book of First Thessalonians. You have shown us with a vision to create authentic Christians what an authentic life looks like. As you've given us this vision to create authentic Christians, you have made clear in your word how we ought to live as authentic Christians before you and in the world. Thank you. Now, Lord, as we've received, let us put into practice that which we know. Thank you for what you are doing in us, what you're doing for us, and what you will do through us as we walk by faith and walk in obedience to your word and to your way. Father, I pray for the saints in the house that your word will uphold them, your word will undergird them, your word will encourage them, your word would not only would, uh, would, admon would only admonish them, but motivate them to be more of who you have ordained for them to be and submit themselves more to your will and to your way. 
And for those in the house that may not have made a decision for you, are still on this on the outskirts of trying to figure out who it is they truly want to believe in and who it is they truly want to be. Can I just speak to you for just a moment and ask you three things? First of all, let me ask you to ask yourself this question. If, if you are still on that outskirts trying to figure out which way to go, you, you have to believe that you're not here by accident. And maybe you didn't think about that, but you didn't come here just because you made up your mind to come to Ecclesia this morning. You came here because God ordained for you to be here. You came here because God put it in your spirit and by his spirit prompted you and led you to this place. Because the Bible says no man comes unto the father except the spirit draw him. So that's the first thing that ought to encourage you about God's love for you. That he chose you to draw you to have you come to this place to hear this word today. That's how much he loves you. Now, based on that and based on understanding that, and if you receive that in your spirit, the question that I have to ask you is that do you believe that what you heard today, do you believe, do you actually believe that what you've heard today is the actual and is the word of God? Do you believe that you've heard from God today? Did what you hear prick your heart? Did what you hear kind of make you think about some things? Did what you hear make you pause and think about your relationship with God? If it did, do you believe that it's the word of God? If you say yes to that, then do you believe that it not only is the word of God, but do you believe that it's the word of God for you? <laughs> God brought you here for a reason and he led you here. So now once you've heard what you've heard, do you believe God spoke to you? Do you believe God is speaking specifically to you in your life, telling you some things that you need to do, telling you some things that you need to make some decisions about and even get in order? And if you do believe that it is the word of God and you do believe that this word of God is to you, then can I ask you this last question? Then what's keeping you from making a commitment? Are you ready to commit to this now? Now that you really believe that it's the word of God and are you really believe that this word is for you and that God led you to this place? What more do you need to know that God loves you? What more do you need to know that God wants a relationship with you? What more do you need to know that God has an intent for your life and wants you to fulfill a purpose that he created you for, but he's waiting for you? To decide to say yes to him, to say yes, Lord, and surrender your will to him. If you are ready to do that, and if you know and you agree with the things that I've asked you and you at this point right now where you say, yeah, pastor, I'm absolutely ready. I, I know I need to make commitment. And I believe what I've experienced this morning is leading me to make this commitment. Then if you are really ready to do that, then listen, let me lead you in a prayer. The prayer that I'm about to lead you in is not necessarily the key to fulfilling this commitment. It's just giving you the words to say. The key is that you are sincere. As we've been talking about authenticity, the key is that you're authentic. The key is that you're real. The key is that you're honest with God. And I'm just giving you what to say from your heart to God. So when you repeat after me, I want you to make these words your words and mean them from your heart. Don't talk to me. Talk to God and make this request of God. And I promise you, if you are sincere, I promise you, if you are real, when we end, end, end this prayer, you will no longer be on the outskirts. You'll be in the family. You no longer be have to wonder about your relationship with God. You'll know that you're now a child of God. And you don't have to worry about where the Holy Ghost is. He will be right there in your heart and in your life from now until the day you see Jesus' face. But if you're ready, just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins I open the door of my heart and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord take control of my life forgive me of my sins fill me with your spirit Make me who you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, if that was the first time you prayed that prayer with me this morning, welcome to the family. Welcome. You're saved. Listen, you belong to Christ and he now belongs to you. 
you are assured that this one fact, that the moment you could be absent from this body, you will be present with the Lord. Listen, if you did pray that prayer for the first time, not to embarrass you, not to put you on the spot, but we want to rejoice with you because all of us had done that at one time or another. We prayed that same prayer, I, I included, to receive Jesus. But if you don't mind, if you want to make us feel good, you want us to rejoice, if you prayed that prayer, if you don't mind, we just raise your hand wherever you are so we can see who you are. Pastor, I prayed that prayer this morning for the first time. I did that. I did that. Just lift it up and put it down. That's all you got to do. Just want to see who. God bless you. That's one hand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you. Listen, right in part of the seat is a QR code. If you look in the back of the seat in front of you, you can pull out a QR code. And let me encourage you to scan that QR code because we want to we want to help you in your journey. And listen, and if you don't mind, when we end our service today, right back here through this door, they've got a very special gift for you just because you prayed with us today. We've got something very special we want you to take home with you. So if you just go back there, get that, and you can come right back out and be on your way. We just want to bless you because because you are part of the family now and we want to welcome you to be a part of the family and let you know that we're going to encourage you in every way we can. Come on, everybody. Let's give our, 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 our new brother, our new brother in the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. God bless you, my brother. Praise God for you. Hallelujah.